I, that's just so interesting because you're just you're wasting your money. But you know, that's what I mean. To be, we're both Division One athletes, Nick. I know we don't talk about it ever on this podcast. You know, like we're yeah. regular guys, right? But we're not. I mean, it does take a level of um, perseverance, commitment, fortitude, uh, a lot of really, really things. A lot of things that people don't have. Uh, it takes to just be a football player and then a divisional football player at that. Scholarship guys, um, whether you play at that level or not at a major capacity, like literally getting there and then being there for four to five years is like you possess something that most people don't possess. I just I, I think it's interesting to me as I look around to the workforce is that there are some people making some really good money out there that are mm-hmm. some pretty big positions that don't deserve it. And you can always tell those guys, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. whether I ever attain uh, being a CEO or a CFO or if that's something I do in my life or my career, that'd be great. But for me personally, I hope I earn it. And I hope that I have, uh, like you have your commitment group. I hope I just have something intrinsically, you know, that I work off of, that I believe in so heavily that I do it that way every single week. Mm-hmm. Um, because ultimately, right, like you have this commitment group, if you could – rely on yourself as well as you rely on six others, you would do it. It's just like, that's really hard to do. And especially as like a young adult, it is hard to stay committed. It's hard to like stay focused. You need people in your life. So I don't know, man, if I was paying $200, I'd be be all over it. That's kind of just, (laughs) it's just odd. Somebody, somebody is just like, uh, I don't know. I think some of the biggest things that I've seen just from being, being a part of the group, you know, the main thing is like we've got this guy that's way older than we are, that's experienced a lot more life than we have. And, you know, I think whenever you hire any coach, right, whether it's a sports coach or um, a personal professional coach, um, you know, whatever it is, I, and, I, and I think more so specifically with a personal or professional coach, you want to be more like that person. If you don't want to be more like that person, you probably shouldn't right. hire him as a coach, right? Maybe, maybe, but maybe it's something very specific, right? Like maybe you don't like this guy as a person, but he's killer at sales. That might be a guy that you hire him and he's going to take you under his wing and show you everything that he knows about sales. Like that's, that's the idea. Right. Um, But dude, like there's been so many things that I don't know that I would have ever picked up on at 25 um, without, without somebody else kind of showing me the ropes, you know? And that's been, that's been huge just as far as, okay, you want to be intentional about your life. Have you thought about these things? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about the relationships with your friends and family? We were just talking about fun, right? Fun, I guess, uh, according to my coach, is one of the biggest problems that men have. They don't have fun. They don't have enough fun. They're too serious. They don't have enough time with their friends or they don't have enough time, you know, uh, re-energizing and rejuvenating and resting. Um, it's, It's all about go, go, go pursue, pursue. And, uh, and there's no time to like sit back and relax and celebrate the wins along the way. You know, do you know what I've kind of noticed a little bit? That's, I guess a little different than athletics, but it doesn't matter what you're talking about in terms of characteristic when it comes to being successful time management. If you want to be a top one percenter, you better be a top one percenter in time management, or you better hire somebody that gets you on a clock that's within the top 1%. And I mean, just doing things, uh, you want to make a lot of money, schedule it out right. Like you got to be a one percenter there. Then how prepared are you to everything you go to? Do you read? Do you write, take notes? Do you do this? Do you do that? Got to be one percenter mm-hmm. there. Then yep. let's say you make a ton of money. Well, how do you how do you personally budget? Because I promise you almost every billionaire, unless you're like, you're just as smart as it gets and you can mess up your entire life and people will throw money at you. Good for you. But <laughs> if you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be a CEO or you want to make a, a ton of money. If you can never figure out your own personal budget, you'll never be there. So you got to be able to budget yourself first. So you got to be one mm-hmm. percent of that. And then commitment level. You got to be an all in guy. You got to be top one percent of that. So I'm just saying like every characteristic to be successful, if you want to be that successful, it's just that life is so much harder than athletics because in athletics, you have somebody making a schedule for you or making your workout for you. Well, you get to real life until you make millions of dollars a year. You don't have enough money to hire somebody to do all that stuff for you. So you just have to do it. And I think that's what I've learned in the last like two years. So that one, nobody really knows what's going on. You can ask two smart people the same thing. They'll give you two different answers. You still got to figure it out on your own. And then yep. the second thing I've learned is that 
if you think you're not doing something well enough, or you're not doing it right, or you're not uh, working hard enough at it or whatever, you're not because all that matters is what you think. Yeah. So, and then you get into the realm of how other people judge your work, how well you do quotas, performance reviews, things like that. But that all gets taken care of if you just have it all right yourself. Mm. You know, so mm. I don't know. It's really interesting. I think it's also a really great time to be a young person with a lot of energy ready to work because the world is changing. We are on a Bitcoin podcast, whether people want to admit or not. I know we're going to get into talk some, talking about some Bitcoin here in a second, but Bitcoin is happening. I mean, like I, I, I'd love I'd love for all like the haters <laughs> to, to, to give me their arguments. Bitcoin is happening. It is getting adopted faster than you could ever believe. And it's a new world. You're a young person. You don't like the world you live in now. Go build a better one. We will have the opportunity to do that in our 30s, in our 40s, in our 50s. And I feel like that's something you should be excited about. There's a lot of people who I, I feel like I talk to that are so weighed down by inflation, elections, um, abortion, war. I mean, depression coming, recession, coming, a lot of negative stuff. But all that yeah. to me personally is Okay, employment's as could be as high as thirty percent. I will find a way to grind my way through whatever the hell is going to happen in the next three to five years. And if you can do that, mm. you're going to have an opportunity to be a part of what I believe is Bitcoin. But you're going to be a part of building the new world, which you should be excited about. You should be learning skills right now. You should be stacking sats if you ask me. But you should be saving your time, however best you feel you can save your time. Mm -hmm. And then when all the dust settles, you should be ready to go because we are young. You know, I feel for people who are in their 40s, 50s, they just are getting thrown into this. There's nothing there's nothing they can really do except for maybe save yeah. as best they can. But all they can do is react to the world that is around them. As young people, we still have the opportunity to set up for the next 50, 60, 70. I mean, like eight, eight, you take care of yourself, stop smoking cigars, 100 years, 120 years, 100. Like who really knows? Medicine is pretty amazing. So I don't know, man. I think yeah. it's really cool that we get on here and do this podcast. I would just implore a lot uh, more people, one, to get into Bitcoin so you can see the world a lot differently than everybody else. Yeah. And then and then two, just build skills. We spend so much money on crap. Pay somebody. You know, if you pay somebody and they promise you they teach you a skill and then you end up not learning anything, okay, it's still better than your $150 all-you-can-eat sushi dinner. <laughs> so I don't know. Like, it's just everybody's going to make the decision, decisions that they're going to make. And I guess this leads to my next point, Nick. I'm so tired of talking to people about Bitcoin, man. Like, I love our podcast. I'll get on here all the time, talk, yep it up. But in my personal life, I'm so sick of it, dude, because it, it, you tell me, everybody, everybody's missing it, man. Everybody's missing it. It has never been more clear to me that there is no crypto. There is no crypto. Like there has yeah. not been a successful project since Bitcoin. If you look at the history of this deal, every exchange that um, lends Bitcoin or tries to get a yield that they shouldn't get or what have you goes to zero or rug pulls you. Mm -hmm. um, the only one we're really waiting on on an application side to bust is Ethereum, which it kind of already has. I mean, yeah. like it really already has. Like you can see, do you know about like uh, meth, M-E-T-H, where you can like, you can put no. your ETH you can like stake your ETH and then stake it somewhere else and then stake it for this token and then get that token and then re-exchange it for the, dude, it's literally like. It's just all bullshit, this. man. It's all bullshit. And it's just so interesting to me as I saw this headline and maybe we could pull this up or talk about this, but meta, I'm pretty sure has already decided like they're not going to be able to build outside the lightning network. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. You were kind of you were talking about that the other day. Um, I'm gonna wh while you hit on that a little bit more because you got to hit on a little bit more. We were talking about it, but I'm gonna look it up see if I can find it. Talk about that a little bit more. Well, I just saw the headline that basically uh, the top engineer for Meta said that they more or less has, have given up on their own crypto wallet. They don't really see crypto wallet as I don't know. It's not gonna be the future for the Meta, which it's not. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And so he was like, we're going to start using integrating the Lightning Network in Bitcoin. Well, obviously, because don't you kind of feel like Meta, this whole crypto thing has a so wrong Web3, whatever. Meta is like Web5 level type stuff. You have mm -hmm. your own digital identity, you're online, you have a job in there, the whole thing. Well, the money you have on there 
should somehow relate to the real world as well. And there is no current uh, crypto project that actually brings anything into the real world like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the real world. It's an energy currency. It is dependent largely on real world environment to, I don't know, for it to be worth more money. Uh, people actually have to have nodes, have lightning wallets, have Bitcoin wallets, need to actually transact. Miners need to actually protect the network via the hashing and all the kinds of stuff that they have to do to validate the whole Bitcoin blockchain. They don't have to do that with other stuff. So I just don't really understand how any of this was ever going to happen without only Bitcoin as the base layer. It's the only yeah, project, cool. it's the only money, digital money that has actually worked thus far and is credible. It's the longest standing blockchain. People don't even understand. Dude, blockchain was before Bitcoin. <laughs> blockchain, Bitcoin is just the longest, the longest blockchain. The most valid blockchain, the blockchain that works. Like blockchain was, I mean, it is blockchain is interesting, but there are different types of DLTs that for different things that work for different reasons. But for a public record, blockchain is perfect. And yeah. Bitcoin is the best implementation of that technology, along with proof of work, along with the double spending problem that's corrected, along with mm -hmm. sound money. Do you think I was thinking about this? Did Satoshi build like the Bitcoin network uh, for the network purposes more or, or sound money? Because I feel like he didn't at all maybe invent this for sound money. But now we're all sitting here like, OK, the network's awesome. And the network makes sense. And nobody disagrees with that, that exchanging money online needs to be a thing. Everybody's arguing yeah. Bitcoin. And in my opinion, the big people are afraid of it because it is a fixed supply, because that does actually drastically chain, change economics in the world. None yeah. of these other ones are actually changing economics whatsoever. The same shit. Same thing. I mean, same mm -hmm. thing. And we were talking about proof of work versus proof of stake, and I love your notes page on that. Maybe we just need to outright share that, but um, Bitcoin is happening. Yeah, I mean, let's let's jump in. Let's jump into <laughs> that real quick because, you know, it's it's interesting in times like right now when the price is down, and everybody's scared. You know, I was actually talking about this with somebody else the other day um, about, you know, the, the layman that hasn't done the research looks at the looks at the dollar price of Bitcoin and is like, oh, Bitcoin's failing. Everything is failing. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to pull out. I'm going to sell. And now I have reduced my risk. And you're like, yeah, that's like that's like I haven't done any research and I'm only in Bitcoin for the speculative investment aspect of it and i'm probably buying and selling on robin hood right like those are the people that are buying at the highs and selling at the lows but at this at the same time when all this stuff is happening guess what's actually happening to bitcoin in the background it's getting stronger the the, the fundamentals of the network are continuing to grow and what griff was mentioning there a second ago was this proof of work versus proof of stake article um, that i'd read it's on bitcoin magazine i'll uh, i'll maybe post the um, the actually, wait a minute. I actually read this article. <laughs> I did, uh, I did a whole article read on this article yesterday. So we're going to post that here in just, uh, here in a few, I don't know when we're going to post that, but that'll be a really good article read. But dude, I mean, let's just go through a couple of these notes here. So I'll, I'll kind of get the key notes here and we'll talk about just the fundamentals. So when we talk about proof of work versus proof of stake, we're talking about consensus mechanisms, which right down here, it says, uh, these can no have without human intervention. Hold on a minute. Uh, okay. Okay. So that. proof of work. Yeah. So proof of work and proof of stake are both consensus mechanisms. These are methods by which everyone uses, or these are methods everyone uses to agree upon the state of the blockchain. Right. So the the real the real issue here is in a decentralized network. How does everyone agree without trusting anyone that this is the state of the blockchain or these things in the blockchain are valid? How do we do that, right? Um, proof of work and proof of stake are the main two um, consensus mechanisms that cryptocurrency is typically er, using right now. Um, but just, just like I'm writing here, so in, in order to eliminate trust in a decentralized network, there must be an isolated set of rules or directives every tran transaction must be in compliance with in order to be accepted as valid by the network. Now, let's get to the answer super quick. Proof of work is the answer. 
Um, it's built into the protocol of Bitcoin. And guess what happens when the price goes down? That doesn't change. It stays the same. <laughs> How beautiful, right? Proof of work itself was actually created by Satoshi Nakamoto. Now it was it was it took a couple of past pieces that had been put together. Um, go read a little bit more on the history of how Bitcoin was created, it, because the whole cypherpunk punk crew, they had they had all worked on these different projects and they had these different iterations of what eventually became Bitcoin. And Satoshi Nakamoto happened to be the one person or people that put all of the right pieces together in the right order. And it turned into Bitcoin and turned into what it is today. But um, so, so kind of diving a little bit more into uh, into the proof of work versus proof of stake stuff. So, this consensus mechanism happens without any human intervention, similar to how we no longer need an operator to connect our call. Right? This is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of times, you think about um, we think about well, how can something be validated, uh, but but there's no trust. Like, how does Bitcoin work? And there's no people. Well, similar to how you don't, whenever you call somebody, whenever I call Griff on the phone, an operator doesn't pick up the phone and say, hey, this is the operator. Who can I connect you with? It's like, it just happens. It's a computer process that happens, right? Um, but uh, so hopping back in here, miners run tons of calculations, which are the inputs that they put into the algorithm to find the predetermined answer, which is the output to the proof of work algorithm. After that correct answer is found, it's then sent out to the entire network of nodes that is that then verify that that is the correct input to generate the predetermined output. And only after that is a transaction valid. Right. And again, here that happens without any human action. Right. Um, now, the the big the big pieces here on proof of work, uh, because these calculations are done by real world computers, they require real world energy expenditure. This is good. If there was no cost for creation, ill-motivated actors may get greedy and try creating more for themselves and in the process devalue the existing supply, right? I mean, this is this sounds like an issue that we're, that we're involved in right now. Uh, you, most of you guys probably know it as inflation, right? That's exactly what this is. If there are ill-motivated actors that have the ability to create more of a money for themselves, they may do that. And if they do... It will devalue. It will, with 100% certainty, devalue the um, the existing supply, right? Now, you might also wonder, like, how, what is the importance of having a third party, you know, review and, and validate everything that's happening on the ledgers here? Uh, well, if you're a company and you, and you have some other third party come in and check your accounting books, right, your ledgers, uh, your statements of, of profit and loss and your balance, uh, your balance sheet, uh, it's, 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 it's good to have another third party come on and, and review that so that you can find that the, if there's any rounding errors or if there's any, uh, data entry errors, things were maybe just input incorrectly or whatever, but, uh, there may also be people cooking the books and trying to make things look like they're not. And, uh, and, and, and the value of having a third party come in is to validate those things, to make sure that what's happening is happening. Um, and proof of work is a non-human audit on the entire network that is Bitcoin. And it's also decentralized, meaning that there's no trusted central authority, right? That's huge. Um, one, one of the quotes in there was that it's an immutable ledger entry that once entered can never be altered. Um, and, and then I, I love that th this one guy's take on the accounting side of Bitcoin and the proof of work system, but he says proof of work is a complete overhaul innovation to double entry accounting, which is cool. Now, the proof of stake, on the other hand, is not tied to energy expenditure at all. It's just tied to the amount of that network's coin that the participant owns or that you own. Right. So in order for a participant to be a part of a proof of stake consensus mechanism, they basically have to own a certain amount, a predetermined amount of that network's coin. And then they get their name put in the hat to be selected as a validator. And if you're selected as a validator in a proof of stake consensus mechanism system, then you get to propose the new block, meaning you you basically, you validate that block. And then all the other validators, the other couple people that get selected to validate your proposed block, if they validate it, then the block, then the blockchain, the entire network accepts it as truth. Um, now where you start running into issues 
with that is that uh, basically those who are wealthy are the ones who validate the transactions on the network. And the people at the bottom that don't have all that uh, wealth in, in network, in the network's coins terms, don't get favored by the network. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. They had one quote in here that they talk about this circular logic that proof of stake operates on. And it's uh, the largest coin holders determine the state of the ledger. And the state of the ledger determines the largest coin holders, right? Which is, you're like, huh, this sounds strange. Uh, so, and put in another way here, and this is a direct quote from, from the article as well, is your ownership of the network determines your authority in the network. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, and this is how, it's funny too, they, they talk about Nick Carter in here, which Griff, I know you got to talk about a little bit, but Nick Carter in here, he talks about how that's exactly how the SWIFT system works, the SWIFT banking system, right? Which we've talked about before. Um, that's how PayPal works. That's how banks work. This is how, this is how almost everything works, right? Whoever's at the top, there's some, a central, some central authority that owns the largest amount of, you know, a company or whatever, right? Think of a CEO, uh, a CEO has the most authority other than maybe call it the shareholders. Um, but the shareholders are really the ones that own the company, right? Now, who has the most authority out of the shareholders? Is it the guy that owns, you know, one share of, you know, however many millions that are outstanding? Or is it the guy that owns 12% of the company that happens to be the largest shareholder? It's that guy. That guy's got the most authority amongst all the people because he owns the most of the network, Right. Same thing happens here with a proof of stake network. So switching Bitcoin from proof of work, they say, I love this one. Switching Bitcoin from proof of work to proof of stake is taking away the energy, the work that goes into validating all of these transactions that happen on the Bitcoin network. This is like making a plane, but taking away flight. It's the key innovation that makes it useful. How interesting is that thought? You know, uh, if, if, we had, if we had Bitcoin on a proof of stake system, is it really decentralized? You know, because then the people that own the most Bitcoin, they control it. So like what happens to the little guy? Whereas on the proof of work, on a proof of work system, on a proof of work consensus mechanism, every single person, any participant can run a, can run a node. You and I, Griff, we can run nodes. I can't believe that we're not. You know, are we real Bitcoiners if we don't run nodes? I think so. Um but anybody, anybody and everybody can run a node, meaning that we can validate the, the entire blockchain, the entire history of the blockchain. That's huge, man. I mean, uh, think about, think about uh, you know, communist China versus uh, free America. You know, I mean, is there any difference there? Yes. Yes. Are, are we completely free in America? I mean, yeah, you know, uh, like that's the idea, but like there are laws and regulations and there's certain things that we can't do that maybe we should be able to do. And there's certain things that we can do that maybe we shouldn't be able to do. And that's a whole nother conversation and debate, right? But these people in China, they ain't got nothing. They, they've got nothing. And that is proof of stake. China, communist China, that is proof of stake. And America, we're closer to proof of work. Not quite exactly, but... You see, you see, I mean, that's that's kind of where we're at here. And the key thing here to mention is that when the Bitcoin price is down, that doesn't change. When the Bitcoin price is down, there's still only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. When the Bitcoin price is down, the, the infrastructure of the network is still being developed. And I would like to call the infrastructure, um, let's call it the ability to spend and transact with your Bitcoin anywhere and everywhere in the world. I mean, that's the network. You know, another thing that, that I was thinking about too, Griff, this week is not one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, but Bitcoin or Bitcoin, capital B or lowercase b, right? And we've talked about the lowercase b is the commodity money and Bitcoin with a capital B is Bitcoin, the network, the investment, right? Uh, I was thinking about this, Griff. Tell me what your thought is on this. I don't think I've told you this yet. Um, Bitcoin can only be an investment for so long. And my thought is, can you invest in the internet anymore? Can you invest in like just you just invest in the internet? And I I would say no. You probably can't. You can't just invest in the internet. I mean, what? How do you invest in the internet? Right? Like the the internet's not owned by somebody. You can't like you can't buy a portion of the internet. Um, but you could invest in the internet. 
back in the day when it was just being you know developed and the investment in the internet in those days was the investment in the growth of the in- infrastructure right so if you could tag in, if you could if you could tap into something that was directly connected to the growth of the internet you know cuz it is a little different here because bitcoin is a network but it also has a, a commodity money attached to it right whereas the internet is just freedom of information so it's it's kind of comparing apples to oranges but you see the comparison i'm making there so like it seems like it seems like bitcoin can only be an investment for so long uh, in the sense that once the network is fully developed and th- that adoption s curve has increased and then plateaued well there's not really any more market share to gain right think of if uh, if amazon totally monopolized and they sold and shipped every single thing that any person ever bought in the world. Well, you can't really invest in Amazon much more because there's there's just no more market share. There's nowhere else they can grow and expand unless they make things more efficient or they get things cheaper. Like that's that's a whole different deal, right? But I mean, the, the network of Bitcoin grows to a certain point and after it, after it hits this full adoption level, well, I don't know exactly what you would call that, it seems like then that investment becomes more stable, right? Which is which is kind of a, a thing that we've talked about a little bit before with the market cap of Bitcoin being so small right now compared to all the rest of the asset classes in the world. Well, hell yeah, it's affected by volatility. It's affected by uncertainty in the macro economy. I mean, what's happening right now with the price of Bitcoin is not a Bitcoin thing. It's a macroeconomic thing. It's a world thing that's happening right now. If you guys have not realized that the rest of the world is also crumbling in these times, then I, I don't I don't know how we got you on the podcast, but thanks for listening. You know, I mean, I mean, everything else is crashing right now. The stock market is crashing. I mean, we didn't even jump into the market check here, uh, but look at look at some of these things here. I, I hope you guys are watching. If you're not watching, um, check us out on YouTube as well as Spotify. Um but you know, look at look at some of these markets here. Like, look at Bitcoin over over the past day. We go uh, this day today. We start out at right around twenty thousand. We drop down to all, you know nineteen thousand three hundred, and now we're sitting back at twenty thousand three hundred. Let's look at the last three months. We uh, three months ago we're sitting at forty five thousand, and today we're sitting at twenty. But look at this here. Uh, now let's look at the last three months of the S and P five hundred. Three months ago, the S&P 500 was at 4,400, and today it is sitting at 3,800. And the charts look almost the exact same. It's crazy, right? And you know, let's look at the let's look at the two year. The two year in the S&P 500, you see a huge rise, a huge increase as the government just floods the economy with money, and all that money ultimately flows to the hardest assets. Which a lot of people, for a lot of people, that was the S&P 500. People put their money in the stock market. That's why you see this huge run up and then you see a huge crash from when is this beginning of 2021, then it starts to crash, right? Now you see it rise from, this is a two year chart. So two years ago, we're the S&P is sitting at 3,100 at a high at the very end of 2020. Yeah, at the very end of 2020, 2021, sorry. It rises all the way up to 4,700. So we're sitting 3,100 all the way up to 4,700, and now it's fall, fallen all the way back down to 3,800. I mean, that's pretty wild. Now, look at the Bitcoin chart. Kind of similar, kind, not really. I mean, Bitcoin starts out at 9,300, runs up, huge run up to 58, uh, 61, and then falls back down to 31. And then a, another big run up to the all-time high at 69,000, I think, was the actual uh, all-time peak. And then it's fallen all the way back down to, to twenty thousand. This is not this is not a Bitcoin thing. This is a macroeconomic thing, right? And and it's uh it's important to always note, Griff. What is it always important to note? One Bitcoin. <laughs> I like that. that was a good one way Bitcoin to is a one Bitcoin. You know that's kind of the thought there. But what Griff? What is your thought on the uh, on the network as an investment, but only for so long? Piece. What's your thought on that? I think my outlook on bitcoin like on the investment piece is i don't really believe in bitcoin as like a a traditional investment at all really because really bitcoin becomes more valuable as everything else becomes less valuable 
you know, like the dollar per se. And Mm -hmm. to touch on like some interesting things, uh, you couldn't invest in the internet, right? There was a dot-com boom and bust, the whole deal. But you could invest in companies that were building on the internet. And currently today, the only investment you can truly, in my opinion, make in Bitcoin, because I don't really believe in investing in Bitcoin mining companies. I literally just think you're fronting. I literally just think you're fronting their cash. Like, I mean, because... (laughs) Don't you agree? I mean, at the end of the day, like all these Bitcoin mining companies, I think Dylan uh, LaCher touches on this quite a bit. Like in a Bitcoin market cap, you divide everything by 20 million, they're not ever going to be Bitcoin profitable. I mean, like there, it only works because you're taking money out of the current system and putting it into a new one. But I view Bitcoin more as a savings. I mean, you know, if if you could picture U.S. dollars never deflating, which is a very hard world to picture. But if you could have held one U.S. dollar that never deflated, never got debased in like 1910, how much would one dollar be worth in today's dollars? You know, it's more of an investment in the monetary network. And if you do enough world history, the world is classified by countries. It's classified by civilizations. It's classified by nation states. It's classified by empires. You know, that's how it's tracked. But it's really... Mm -hmm. Um, how successful was their monetary network? The petrodollar is unarguably very successful for America. We've enjoyed great prosperity. We don't really have much competition. Um, and we are the biggest creditors and debtors after just 50 years of petrodollar, 40 years, give or take. Yeah. And so I kind of view Bitcoin with a big B as more of an investment in the internet as a country, if you can picture that, more of an investment in the sovereign individual because I think unarguably what we're seeing is that in your proof of stake versus proof of work, I can't wait for you to post that. That was really good. But um, proof of stake, you're only as good as your gatekeeper. You're like, your network really is no good. I mean, and that same yep. thing has happened in America today. The Fed is largely pushed around by our government and our government is very largely pushed around by the biggest validators and the biggest stakers. And, yep. you know, whether that's big pharma or energy or for the Saudis in OPEC, you know, like, I mean, at the end of the day, an investment in the Bitcoin network is really an, you're, you're basically buying a, a, like an 18, $1850 that will never debase. I mean, $1 to 100 years ago, if you think about that as something that doesn't debase, like what is $1 in 1910 worth today? Like $100? So yeah, that's a that's a hundred X. And so that's kind of how I see Bitcoin. I see Bitcoin and the network more as like, and I've stated this in the podcast, it is like a country. I mean, because countries are only good if you can spend time in the country, get money for your time, and then spend it in within that network. And yeah. we're all making money. Currently, everybody's making money in other people's networks and then moving it over to this network that has no value, is no intrinsic value, it's not worth anything, it's worthless, it's always crashing, it's so volatile, all this crap you hear about Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, mm-hmm. the network, is actually perfectly non-volatile. There's only 20 million. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. So that's the investment. I mean, you're literally investing in something that <clears throat> has never happened before and will never happen again. I mean, that's just well, the think, case. Think about, think, like, what does, what does, what does Bitcoin truly protect? You know, I mean, when we talk about when we talk about like our freedom and we talk about our ability to act as a free actor, um, at, we talk about free markets, we talk about incentive structures, we talk about time preference. When we talk about when we talk about, you know, Bitcoin is not Bitcoin is not just money. Bitcoin is a way of life. You know, I was talking about this on uh, on Connor's on Connor Chepnick's podcast, which you guys got to go check out. I thought it was a super fun episode conversation was really cool um it is called bitcoin stuff go check it out that out on his podcast we'll put the link down in the description as well but um you know we talked about we talked about a lot of cool stuff but one of the things that we were talking about is like bitcoin is not just money it's not just an investment like bitcoin is a way of life bitcoin is discipline it's a concept right it's more of an idea and and so my thought here with with saying this and, and kind of keeping on the trend of proof of work versus proof of stake is, okay, you know, there, there's been all this FUD here recently about energy expenditure, right? 
energy consumption and we're boiling the oceans and climate change and this and that and this and that. Just for, and just for some is, general clarity, just for some general clarity, you're referring yeah. to proof of work for proof of stake at how it functions as a network. Not not even somewhat as a money, but how it functions as an as a network. Like proof of stake, what you what you were alluding to earlier, how many different examples can you actually think of, of proof of stake? It's China, America's proof of stake, uh, the UK's proof of stake, our current the, uh, the bank Swift system. banking system, PayPal, bank. all banks like the banking system. It's all proof of stake. That's all proof of stake. Hear this out. Hear, hear this out too. What else is proof of stake? It's not what you know. It's who you know. That's proof of stake. Mm. Bitcoin's That's changing the world. Stake. It's what that you know, proof of not who you know. That's what's going to change mm. it. I mean, the world we live in today is proof of stake. The invention of Satoshi Nakamoto's mm. perfect incentives program and proof of work changes mm. the literal every aspect of our lives. I mean, it's yeah. not get on LinkedIn and get 500 connections and just find a recruiter that'll give you a job. It's yeah. what skills do you have? Show me those skills. I'll yeah. give you the job. Don't show me your degree. That's proof of stake. Degree is so proof of stake. I mean, dude, it, fraternities are proof of stake. College football is proof of stake. Oh, you play college football, I'll give you a job. That's proof of stake. Yep. I mean, yep. at the end of the Absolutely. day. So I just so, I mean, so like, think, network, think about know? that, right? So, I mean, what what does what does proof of work protect? What does it protect? Well, all, all of these all of these proof of stake concepts that we're thinking about, right? Is is the current banking system a good system? Well, it was better than maybe what we had before, but it's not a great it's not a great system. It can't be our way forward. It's a broken system, right? Uh, and what does what does this broken system that's ultimately a proof of stake system, this uh, Federal Reserve controlling the entire monetary policy in the entire world via money, what what does that really create? What does that create? It creates a dystopian world where people's time preferences are inherently, heightened but little by little you ne you don't feel it dude people are people are it's it's so step by step that most people don't even feel it they don't even realize it they're like oh it's three percent it's eight percent it's no big deal it'll go down you know and like that's the high time preference that has that has that you've earned over 50 years right that you don't even realize and 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 it's scary too because it compounds right but think about think about this too how many people how many people have died in the industrial military complex system of protecting the trade routes that we've got? How many, how many people have, how many people have lost their lives because their country uh, hyperinflated their, their currency and, and destroyed all the people and people starved and they couldn't get jobs and businesses went out of business. I mean, that's not good, right? Uh, what about all the people heightening their time preferences so much that they don't care to put in the work to live healthy, right? They don't want, they don't care to put in the work to go to the gym several times a week. They don't care to put in the work to cook their own food instead of going out and grabbing fast food. They don't care to put time into developing the relationship with their spouse or their kids or their friends or, or, or call it their career because they'd rather go out and have some beers or they'd rather uh, you know, spend money on some vacation versus saving for the house that we'd like to buy. Or, you know, that's high time preference. And that comes from proof of stake. Now, I say all that to say, Griff, because there's all this energy FUD talking about Bitcoin's proof of work consensus mechanism is boiling the oceans. Well, I've got news for you, brother. It ain't. It ain't. And <laughs> here's the here's the deal. So uh, this, this research was done by Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Policy Institute, and they've got all of their references here. I checked them, Griff. I looked at them. It's real. Listen to this here. I'm just going to read a couple of these. Environmental impact. Bitcoin proof of work accounts for roughly 0.27% of global energy consumption, less than gold mining or residential air conditioners. Also, Bitcoin energy consumption is 28 to 56 percent renewable. Obviously, there's a big gap there. But while U.S. consumption was only 12 percent renewable in 2020, Bitcoin is thus driving more demand for renewable energy than the typical U.S. energy consumer. Now, look at this here. Annual energy consumption. This is kilowatt hours per year. 
Look at Bitcoin mining. Look at the gold industry. Look at residential air conditioners, transmission, distribution, energy loss. Hey, you, you guys want to talk about Bitcoin proof of work is boiling the oceans? Turn off your air conditioners. Turn off your air conditioners. Stop driving. Start eating them bugs. That's that's what we're talking about. So, hey, we want to protect the, hu- the 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 future of humanity. And, and we and we can't we can't decide that we want to allocate 0.27 percent of the global energy consumption to this system that protects all of those situations that we just talked about from not happening. If that doesn't make sense to you, you're just wrong. You're just and wrong. also who can't support this now? Separation I mean, of state and money. Who can't support that? I mean, like you can be on any side and we're we're. I would I would guess most of our listeners or all of all of our listeners live in America. Dude, how many more infringements on our privacy? How many more propaganda attacks can we survive as just citizens? Like, I'm so tired of fighting with my neighbor over nothing other than things that two parties throw at you to continue the current monetary system we are on. I mean, isn't that what this is all about? Like a lot of these guys are just fighting to protect the world we already live in because where's the argument? I mean, like I'll share something too. That's interesting because we've talked about proof of work versus proof of stake, um, which is such a big discussion. I I mean, like, it's so funny though, because Nick, just based on your notes page. Okay, cool. So we can stop the discussion, right? (laughs) Like, like, exactly. Right. Why would anybody, why is anybody putting billions of dollars into proof of stake? Proof of stake is more or less just word salad. It's horseshit. I mean, like, it isn't worth anything. I just find that so interesting. But outside of just the proof of stake and proof of work situation, here, like, I've been seeing this all over the place, but I find this so, uh, find this so interesting. Do you see this? Uh, I do zoom in a little bit if you can. Uh, maybe. Can you see the Uganda, like, they just discussed, I mean, this was a little bit ago, but Uganda discovered $12 trillion. Oh, worth yeah, I did hear about that. Which, I mean, literally. Go, go, go like, through that. Read, read like the first, read the first paragraph of that. What does it say? Let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. But Uganda discovered like a huge gold deposit. Uganda announced that it had discovered 31 million metric tons of gold waiting to be mined in the country after several surveys were conducted. A spokesperson from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in Uganda, Mm. said that these reports are aimed at attracting gold miners and investors in the crypto sector. See, like... What what does that tweet say? um, Mining in Uganda. Groundbreaking ceremony. Dude, these guys are just super juiced that they found gold. I mean, they're they're freaking... They're freaking... Which is, A, I mean, like, they they should be excited because currently gold has a lot of value. Wait until America finds out it's not the largest gold holder. Gold will have no value very quickly in the current state that we are in because it's not about gold anymore. It's about black gold, which is oil. And yep. what, like, you can't sit here and say that we could use gold the way we used to. It literally wouldn't work. I mean, it would be so labor intensive, cost so much money to every citizen in any country where, okay, Russia and the United States, now that they can't agree, they need to settle upon a gold standard. Okay, that's not going to go very well. So gold doesn't, I mean, one, as a money, it's already, we can go over the history and I can shoot people the different kinds of podcasts where guys deep dive the old gold standard and how America was able to just kind of manipulate the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Or we could just talk about the fact that they just found half of it, half of the world supply they just found. Like that doesn't, that doesn't, see, it doesn't work anymore. But the other thing that we're, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I just think it's interesting, you know, like we were talking about proof of of work, but then let's talk about the Bitcoin with a small B. Yeah, it's the best money that's ever happened. We've never even had a fixed supply of anything. Economists all over the world would have to rework every theory they have, in my opinion. I mean, like, because it's changed money, which I don't know, like, if there's any books from like the like earlier on where people are like, (laughs) yeah, if we just had a fixed supply with no inflation, that would be really good. Like. I'm, of course it would, but it's not even conceivable. The other thing that we've t- hit a lot on, on this podcast is proof of work, proof of stake, um, why Bitcoin is so great, why Bitcoin is so great, why Bitcoin is so great. 
And there is so much talk right now about Bitcoin maximalism. It's pretty funny, um, which I can share this screen too. Like Nick Carter is a Bitcoin guy and I don't, I don't think we mean to hate on him. Right. But he like tweeted this about like some crypto wallet, some platform and he promoted it. And you know how that goes. If you're a guy that got most of your following from defending Bitcoin and you got to be popular within kind of the Bitcoin way of the world. Yeah. Uh, anytime you take on another project, you're going to get drilled by people who don't really see that as. Can you um, can you zoom in on your screen a little bit? It's like it's like super small on our side or on my side anyways. Oh, it kind of is, huh? Um, yeah. You know, I, I have seen a lot of that stuff with Nick Carterville. I saw I mean, everybody's dragging him through the freaking dirt, man. And like, I guess like, I don't know, like I haven't done enough research to really like have my own opinion on the deal, but yeah. like it is, it is kind of weird, you know, like, dude, have you seen what, like, have you seen all the stuff with Anthony Pompliano? Like I, he's like, he's really he seems like he's bending over backwards for the crypto community, which is like, you know, it, it's kind of strange because like Matt Moore, who we've had on the show um, and been on his radio show. Go check that out. That was fun. We'll put that in the in the description below as well. But um, you know, he's he's a big he's a big believer in you know Bitcoin maximalism in that Bitcoin is is the one and only uh, as far as the end game goes. But he also doesn't believe that we should just shit on everybody that's playing in the crypto game because there has to be some bridge between between the two, right? Because you know, I mean, you you're a great example. Like you. Uh, you were a guy that that started in in crypto and then found yourself to Bitcoin, found yourself in, you know, moving toward Bitcoin. But what if at that point, uh, some of the, the people that introduced you to Bitcoin found out you were playing crypto and they were like, oh, you're an idiot, blah, blah. And they were talking all this shit about you. Well, then that probably halfway deters you away from it. Right. So it's like I, I get like I get where these people are coming from when people start shilling what we believe to be scams and wastes of money not to say that there's not a speculative investment side of it because there is right but it's like you can't promote this stuff as like the answer i get that but like man they're really dragging this guy through the mud yeah i just i do understand where you're coming from my whole thing is like if we continue on um and you can you put our screen back up with his tweets mm-hmm if you keep going, like I more so talk about how, like, once he received a lot of this negative uh, attention because he promoted something that does support crypto and Bitcoin, and honestly, I haven't really even read into the project. It looks like a wallet. Um, looks like a wallet that his investment firm is in. Uh, and I know I've now it's all kind of coming out that I know Nick is maybe from a little bit of money, and you can see that he's getting into it with a lot of these Bitcoiners and. What was the one tweet where he was like, that's why it's called private equity, not for random Twitter. Which he's not, hey, wait, hey, which, hey, he's not, he's not lying. Like he's, he's not, not lying. He's not like, lying for sure. He said something as well about, um, I talk to founders daily, um, making fun of people trying to like actually help Bitcoin or defend it. And here, here, here's the whole thing. Who, one, who cares? Bitcoin doesn't care, so I don't really care. But the other thing is that we just talked about a monetary network, and most people who would study this agree, like, the United States is largely the United States because everybody respects the dollar. They respect the monetary network, just like everybody who probably respected the pound, just like everybody respected gold, you know? It's all about mm -hmm. uh, trust and how much you respect this monetary network. Bitcoin is, it's, it like, is helping the internet become a country. It is the native currency of the internet, as Jack Dorsey puts it. I don't mind people defending it. Like, I don't. And to be perfectly honest with you, there's not very many Bitcoin maxis. I don't really like the term maximalist. I don't really, like, understand why that's the term. But there's a lot of Bitcoiners that are defending it from the standpoint that, do you think patriots would have defended America in 1777? Like, do you think, do you think anybody who... Uh, is a revolutionary, isn't going to defend uh, their idea. And I think it's good because after the last 13 years, and actually if you study the stuff like you're talking about earlier, like even the earlier iterations of digital cash, yeah, it's been littered with scams. And Bitcoin was the first successful implementation. And then after Bitcoin, now everybody's trying to basically build 
new types of money and say that they're decentralizing some platform. And that's what got me into crypto, as you alluded earlier. Like, yeah, I got into this concept originally because, yes, I do think that networks and technologies and money especially should be decentralized. I don't really think center points of failure and anything like that is good. And I think anything that you can decentralize and take out mediums is good. It is good. But, but... T TRX or BTT or ETH or Solana or Binance or Voyager or any of these networks and exchanges and tokens and crazy promises they made and NFT networks, they have all failed. I mean, let's look at this. We do have enough history now. They've all failed. So all the Bitcoin guys are out here saying is they're scams. All Bitcoiners are saying is there is currently no company uh within this digital space that's investable outside of the little b and big b of Bitcoin. They're not saying that that can't happen. They're saying that it has not happened. They're saying yeah. that we're not building a world where we need exchanges. We're not building a world where we need massive amounts of credit. And I don't think they're wrong for defending it. And I do think like, dude, if you're going to outright like invest in a company and then promote it, don't hate on the people that don't like it. Like, they don't like it. Like, why is he getting so, – like, I draw attention to the Nick Carter thing because dude is so butthurt that people want to defend what they believe in. Clearly, if he's so offended, he doesn't he, he doesn't feel very justified in what he's doing because anybody yeah. that knows anything, if you do a project or you build a company or, or what have you, you don't care about the first thousand people people's opinions. You care about, you know, two years from now what you're building. Now does it have the traction – uh, that I thought it would. So I don't know. It's all really interesting. Um, but the only thing that we know in the digital space today, and you can look at all the other projects because at some point they're faster or had some laser eyes or whatever. <sighs> one Bitcoin has always been one Bitcoin and it will always be one Bitcoin. There's nothing else you can say about any of these other projects. They don't, they don't work. And so I, I don't know. I don't really hate the defending of Bitcoin feverishly because I do it now. Because I've been in the scams and I got out of them luckily enough to where like I probably made a little money. Um, I learned a tough lesson one or two times with a couple of bad investments. And yeah, then I realized like in my two and a half, three year crypto journey, uh, I started with Bitcoin, ventured out a little bit because I enjoyed like the concepts, the D apps, the all, all this cool stuff they're talking about. It's just cool stuff. Yeah. Once you realize all of all of these um, BTTs and Cardano's and uh, XRP and like all this stuff, like XRP was cool until Strike was invented. <laughs> like, I mean, like it was cool until the Lightning Network were, well, the Lightning Network was made. I think the next um, big project that Bitcoiners will get behind is a side chain that becomes investable. Uh, but like, you know. I don't know, like, I don't know when it's going to happen. And I also don't really know why everybody is searching for these little wins, man, these quick wins, these the easy money. Like, that's not what Bitcoin is about. So I don't know, like everybody can have their take, but <clears throat> I love the Bitcoin maxis. I love Bitcoin maximalism. I love that Bitcoin is it because it is. It's not really a, an argument. And if you go out here and you promote something that takes crypto and tokens and whatnot, I mean, like, I mean, are you personally liable for what happens to these people? I mean, I'd love to know because Pomp is another one you brought up and I listen to Pomp religiously or I used to. And now I find I almost, well, anybody, yeah. almost find anybody else to listen to because I don't I don't really view him as 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 credible as I used to, because maybe he is a Bitcoin guy. Full on, only Bitcoin. Bitcoin's all he has his money in. It's the only project he's in. And I kind of do largely believe that. But he is now on record going, well, what's what's somebody trying to buy $10 billion worth of Bitcoin? How's that bad? Uh, because you're fucking the people. They're like, that. that's what's bad. And I know Pomp's on the record saying, oh, NFTs are going to be a thing. Yeah, but not on OpenSea. Not where you don't even own it. I mean, we're talking about property rights. We're talking about ownership. We're talking about sovereignty. And none of these other tokens have achieved that. And the only people that I truly see defending the Bitcoin network, the only true pe people that I see defending what matters here 
are the maximalists that are on Twitter or are the people that are hating on somebody for shilling about a project. And that's not a bad thing. Look at how far or not far America's come from a, from a, from a personal rights standpoint. We're heading in the exact wrong direction because at some point, everybody let, oh, Ethereum, no, that's a good idea. Let's do that. The, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, Democrats, Republicans, like any of these ideas that America has let build within itself. I mean, uh, Rome died from inside itself, right? Like it, it ate itself. I feel like that's kind of what's going to happen with America. And ultimately, the cool thing about Bitcoin is that it can't do that. You can't, so like, I think... Uh, I don't know, man. People will all come around to it, whether they would like to or not. Um, and that's just kind of that. But uh, the whole Nick Carter thing is crazy. The pomp. I mean, you can hate on them. I don't choose to hate on them. I just choose to go find uh, better information and go find guys that I like listening to. Maybe we should all stop listening to the Nick Carters and the pomps and find other people who are actually more invested in Bitcoin and go talk to them. Maybe Sailor needs to stop getting on their podcast, maybe. Robert Breedlove needs to stop promoting any of these other guys, but ultimately, maybe maybe we should just all start reading and researching and coming up with our own opinions. Maybe that would be a good op option, right? Like, may maybe it would be. You know, uh, another thing I was thinking about this past week was, dude, I, I feel like I feel like the longer that we do the podcast, the longer that I've been in Bitcoin, the more that I research, the more that I learn. Uh, the more podcasts I listen to, all of these things, the more that I get into it, the more that I'm like, dude, I don't know shit about any of this. You know, like you, you obviously you obviously learn more and you know more, but like in comparison to everything that this thing really impacts, dude, it's like, how, how can you ever know this stuff? You know, like, um, you know, thinking sure. back to the episode with Charlie Spears, you know, he had talked about. A couple of things. One, we don't have the language really to communicate like exactly what's happening right now with Bitcoin. Uh, I think it'll be interesting in 15 or 20 or 30 years when we look back, you know, in hindsight 2020 and we're able to realize exactly what was happening during these times right now. Right. It'll be interesting to go back and see uh, what our thoughts are today versus what they're going to be in the future. So that's one thought. And then, uh, Another, oh, dude, if I lose this thought, man, this was a good one. No, I mean, you're 100% right. But <clears throat> so, I mean, but the idea, though, is like, oh, sorry. The other one that, that Charlie was saying was that Satoshi Nakamoto wasn't, wasn't just a genius in monetary policy. You know, he wasn't just a genius in, in, uh, in, in cryptography and computers, right? This guy had to either... Either it was a complete accident or there was some type of there was some type of knowledge somewhere. I'm going to say somewhere because I don't know if this is a divine type of intervention from God or if this is strictly a human creation. But, you know, there was some information somewhere that made all these things happen the way that they did. And the way that it happened means that Satoshi Nakamoto ha had to have. He doesn't. Ha he didn't have to have understood. But what he, what you have to be in order to be an expert in Bitcoin is you've got to be an expert in economics. You've got to be an expert in uh, the history of humanity. You've got to be an expert in philosophy. You've got to be an expert in uh, what else? Religion, uh, politics. Um, education, uh, work, like yeah, the, or, the, or you just, just, or you just so created from things. I just think that it's one of those things where I don't think even Satoshi knew what he was doing. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, but I also don't. I don't think anybody Very could well ever be. see like what's happened. Okay, boom, we created Bitcoin. Uh, now there's like these other crypto projects, which Satoshi probably would have said, "Yeah, go ahead, like make something better." Like, make something better. And that's why I asked earlier. Like, I know he alluded a lot in hints, like 6102, uh, obviously, it's created right after 2008. Like, obviously, he understood the money side of it, but the cryptography side of it, the incentives program of it, the proof of work of it, what you're saying is like, 
that's what they can never figure out. I mean, that's what that's what Milton Friedman talks about, a trusted e-cash where you don't need A, B, and C, you just need A and B. And mm-hmm. that's all, I mean, that's really all he did. It's just that that concept has never happened. And yeah. what that is doing is it is, it's only been 13 years, dude. And all this guy did was build a project on the internet and it's worth $20,000 a coin now. I mean, that's all we really need to know. And he's never touched it, more or less could be dead. And even if he were alive, it doesn't matter that he has a million coins or whatever. It does. It actually just does not matter because what's he going to do? Spend them? Great. Then somebody else is going to have them. Oh, what's he going to do? Block transactions? Can't do it. Has literally no bearing on the hash rate and how the network is protected. So there, you bring up you bring up an interesting point there with Milton Friedman. Um, I've got that video pulled up. I don't know. Let me see here. Let me make sure that you can hear the sound on this. It's like it's like one of my favorite videos is like all these guys. Like I'm pretty sure there's an article where Henry Ford's like, dude, digital cash will be perfect. And I think they're all just alluding to the separation of money and state is necessary. It's like very necessary because look okay, at on. every every empire that's ever existed is. Failed. Okay, L- listen to this here. This is a quick 53 seconds. This is powerful. This is in, let's see, what, what year is this? Do we know? Does it tell us? There's no, There's literally, there's no comments. There's 73 views. This is literally the first one that I found. So let's just play it. So that I think that the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. And the one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. The way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you, then there's no record of where it came from. And you, you may get that without knowing who I am. That kind of thing will develop on the internet and that will make it even easier for people to use the internet. Of course, it has its negative side. It means that uh, the gangsters, the people who are engaged in illegal transactions will also have an easier way to carry on their business. I mean, what a powerful, what a powerful little video there from obviously a long, a long time ago, um, literally, r- literally talking about what Bitcoin is today. I mean, semi, semi. West, because, because the only thing that I feel like he gets off i guess which is so crazy that he was able to talk about internet cash and all these types of things he was talking about that from a pure internet's perspective like the internet's being made he goes wow this is going to change the world yeah bitcoin is verifiable it's on a blockchain it's terrible for criminals why because yes in 20 30 years let's if there's illicit transactions or let's say that there's a lot of criminal activity going on is the bitcoin network going to stop the transactions no because that's just not how the network works will they be able to find you Absolutely, especially if you ever transfer to the layer one, see how transparent the layer twos are, like lightning. Um, but you know what he also d- didn't understand? How many people built on the internet for free? Twitter, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's free. And that's the way the world should be. I, I bring this all the way back to, we're trying to build a, a better world. We really are. I mean, like everybody's trying to build a better world. 99, I think 99% of people are tired of living in the world that it is today. And it's mostly driven by a very old school thought of money, which is like, we've been doing money this way for so, so long. And nobody's thought about it differently. And nobody's done anything different. But it goes to this point, I was watching the Doctor Strange movie. Have you seen Doctor Strange? I've seen the first one, but I haven't seen the new one, though. I just thought it was so interesting because it was probably a very political move or probably was not Who knows why they put this in there? But they were in like a, it's like a multiverse, right? And they were in a different universe. And Doctor Strange or the girl he was traveling with, like they didn't understand the universe or they just were really hungry and they went and grabbed a hot dog. And dude chases her down and was like, you didn't pay for that. Doctor Strange like, you didn't pay for that. You got to pay for that. She's like, this is so stupid. She's like, this universe, you have to pay for food? And I was like, oh, that's such so interesting. And I'm not somebody, I don't believe in handouts. I don't believe in socialism. But I do believe there is a way to create more of a utopian society um, via sound money. I think Bitcoin's our only way because yeah. I don't think anybody's going to argue like with the introduction, like technology does make the world easier and cheaper. And it also like relieves the need for 
human labor, like physical labor. And we are going to run into a point in time. Now we're getting to the hour and 12 minutes. Now we're getting futuristic. But <laughs> there, there's not really – I don't envision a society where we can just keep creating unnecessary jobs. I mean, like, we will have to eventually transition, in my opinion, to some form of a UBI where the basic standard of living – um, you know, comes from a tax or just comes from a, a huge crown fund or the people who do have jobs or can make money or what have you. Like there will be a need for that. There will be a need uh, to help people at, at some point, I kind of think. But the only way we get to a better society than what we sit in today, because I do truly think America is the best inter- iteration of fiat money. America is the best iteration of like pre-Bitcoin um, economics. I mean, look at this country. You can you can talk shit all you want. This is the best it's ever ever been, ever for humans ever. <laughs> America is the best it's ever been. The only way to truly do better is to fix the money, because I mean, technology, yeah, we're fine. Military weapons, yeah, we're fine. Space exploration, yeah, we're getting somewhere. How much better could all that be under a better money standard? Probably a lot, but also, yeah. how much better is can the average person's life be? Because we we have to like balance it out. Maybe we find a new civilization, maybe we don't. But if you're living on this earth, it shouldn't be so damn hard. And everybody should kind of be able to enjoy a basic life, especially America is the richest country to ever exist. Yeah, I live in Sacramento, California. Every single stoplight I was at today had a homeless person begging for money. And I feel terrible. I have the heart. I want to give the money. But my whole thing is there is no system there is no network there is no like real good way about fixing any of these problems currently and that's kind of i mean that's like the utopian or um extremely optimistic side of me it's like dude if we want to fix the world we do literally have to pick bitcoin but we have to fix the money and fix the money fix the world so man i love this podcast dude you want to know why because we started talking about life goals and we started talking about You know, some of like the in-betweens, the proof of stake, the proof of work, and just like, trust me, Nick and I, one, don't have enough Bitcoin to really just be like, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. We're actually rooting for this price to go down. (laughs) Like, we would love, (laughs) love, like, because we believe in the network. We believe in the investment. We believe in what's going to happen. We have done a lot of homework on what is, what is the new world's money going to be? Because there's, I mean, how many liberals, how many big figures have to come out and say, New world order, liberal world order, everything's changing, NATO, war. Yeah, guys, everything's changing, and it's changing from a globalist perspective. So you better as well hope for Bitcoin. What are you going to root for? And the coolest part of Bitcoin. Govern me harder, daddy. (laughs) Yeah, dude, it's crazy what some people want. (laughs) um, I mean, that's that's, that's almost kind of like both ends of the extreme, right? It's like complete freedom or complete central authority control. Which one do you want? And if you want one end or the other, you know, we're, you're probably not going to get either completely. You might you might get complete authority authoritative control if you go some communist state like China or something, right? Or North Korea, right? That's complete control. You're not going to find complete freedom anywhere. Um there are, there are still laws and regulations that kind of are just over the world, right? You're not going to have complete freedom mm-hmm. anywhere. But if you want more freedom than you do central control, well, then we've got to take a step in that direction. And you know what ain't a step in that direction? Saving your money in cash. Saving cash dollars. Buying U- United States treasuries. The World Reserve Treasury. You Don't buy that. Don't buy that. That's a step closer to authoritative control, right? Do you want do you want uh, do you want the government to tell you uh, what to do, what to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Do you want them to tell you what your kids should think? Do you want them to make all the decisions for your life? If the answer is no, like I would assume most people would think, I would I would assume that most people would say, I don't want the federal government to control everything in my life, right? If that's the answer. You should probably buy Bitcoin because if if the central government, the federal government, the Federal Reserve, which is not the federal government, but it's quasi government agency. Right. If the Federal Reserve is controlling money and can and money is how you and I can 
communicate with each other in the open markets, the open markets in the economy, well, then if they're controlling it and manipulating it, well, then that somehow means that they're kind of controlling and manipulating the markets. And if they're controlling and manipulating the markets, do you think that that has any real world effect on you? Yes, it does. Wow. We're using our brain. See how this happens, right? I mean, it's crazy, dude. Like once you get in, I mean, Griff and I, we look like absolute psychopaths from the outside looking in. We look like complete idiots. We got no idea what's going on because we're swimming against the stream as is every other Bitcoiner. I'm telling you, take, take, take one of those pretty little orange pills and swallow that sucker and watch the world change before your eyes. You'll never be able to unsee what you see after you dive down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. That is the absolute truth. And you know, it's funny, like Griff right now, thinking about you know the Bitcoin class of 2020, I would, I would include myself in the Bitcoin class, I guess, of 2021. But you know, thinking about the year that you bought Bitcoin and the amount of time that you've held Bitcoin, shows what your belief level is right if you've held bitcoin for longer than uh at, at this point today if you've held if you've held bitcoin for longer than uh um uh, well i mean i guess you could probably even say for a couple months at this point uh but if you've held bitcoin longer than a couple years you, you probably believe in it you know it's some well i say that if you've held it longer than four years let's call it four because you had that that huge run-up in covid where everybody was excited and all that stuff but if you've held it through the ups and downs, you probably believe in it for the right reasons, right? But I am just now seeing my first like real downturn in the markets and and start in continuing to buy, continuing to buy. And everyone around me that hasn't done the research is like, man, ooh, yeah, price is down. What do you think about this? Ah, it's not good. And I'm like, yes. yeah, see, the price doesn't really have anything to do with the value of Bitcoin, right? doesn't have anything to do with the value of Bitcoin. Doesn't It doesn't impact, it doesn't change the fundamentals of the protocol, right? The proof of work consensus mechanism that we had talked a little bit about. It doesn't change that, that the network is expanding. It doesn't change the fixed supply of 21 million Bitcoin. It doesn't change any of that. So why does my investment in those things change if the dollar price goes down? Well, the dollar price is going to go up and down. It's a macro economy. There's other things that happen in the world that impact this. And they it the just dollar blows my mind. In six months too. Like the dollar is not exactly like, that's what's so funny. You're, measure, you're measuring a stable asset class against a literally non-stable network. It's not even stable. Yeah. I mean, like it, it doesn't even really make sense. So if you're investing in Bitcoin, and I'm not gonna lie, like literally the dollar price of Bitcoin is like my homepage. Well, I look at that, I look at that hundred times a day, probably. I only really have it up there because it's like I find it interesting. I find the price movement interesting for right now. But look at you this. Know what oh Jesus. You know what look scares me more than anything? Crypto or something, huh? What scares me more than anything is somebody who's really just building, continuing to build their DCA stack. Like I don't have a trading stack. Like, I'm just trying to build my savings in Bitcoin, right? Like, I'm still just trying to get to one Bitcoin. If I could, that would be awesome. And what scares me is that when you get to times like now where Bitcoin is just egregious, it really is egregiously undervalued at 20000 I mean, even today. Yeah. What scares me is that everybody thinks this is like, um, thinks it's like the bottom or they're like, oh, well, there's still like 5000 more to go. It's like, dude, if all you're waiting for is like five grand, I mean, like, that's so silly because. How do you spell Pfizer, on, dude? I don't know how to spell Pfizer. How do you spell Pfizer? P-F-I-Z-E-R. All I'm saying is if you're buying, like, if you're buying <laughs> Bitcoin right now and building your stack and you're worried about buying it between 20 and 60 and 10 and 8, and who cares, dude? Like, really, who cares? It, it doesn't. It, it literally does not matter. Why? Because you're taught, like, just take gold as an example. If Bitcoin, which is obviously a way better store of value than gold, not even really that close. It's more of an adoption than it is about, like, it's not like a if, it's a when. Gold is what? Like a $14 trillion market cap? Bitcoin's not even one? I mean, okay, so let's owe it in golf stats. So what's the USD price of it then? Okay, what's the USD price when everybody is so sick and tired of the current base layer money, which is bonds and treasuries? What happens when those go out? 
what do institution, institutions do then? There's nothing better for them to invest in than Bitcoin. The only thing that they have left to understand is the energy FUD and they need to verify. They probably need to run their node. These big systems probably need to maybe hire a few people that they trust and boom, two trillion, three trillion, four trillion. Then you're out. I mean, then you're out of the cheap Bitcoin. Bitcoin will be cheap forever. It is the best form of money the world's ever seen. It's cheap right now. I mean, whether you want to admit that or not. And everybody wants, to, you know, uh, what is it called? Number preference or people don't like big numbers because like, oh, I can't own this. I can't own that. Bro, you buy a mortgage that's backed by a state and like a bank promise that if you pay this mortgage off in 30 years, it's yours. The basic premise of a 30 year mortgage doesn't really work. They've been lending out money at like a 2% or less rate for like 12 years. And that's just right now. Like, how does that actually affect the money supply? How does that actually affect like the treasuries, the base layer? I mean, dude, it's so confusing nowadays. Nobody even knows. I mean, nobody actually really even knows. Some people are smarter than others. They understand how, you know, stocks work, how markets move, except for the fact that the best trader ever is Warren Buffett and the dude just spot buys. He doesn't, he spot buys and holds for a long time. That's the only real investing yeah. you can do. All these day traders, bro, they like ask anybody, they always end up at zero. Like the only in, investing is long term. I don't believe in day trading and short term investing and all, all of these other things, which mm-hmm. maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right. But I only invest for like more of a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, 40 year, 50 year outlook. I mean, I don't know yeah. why I'd invest money to hopefully get a bigger return in, in 30, 365 days. I don't care. I mean, I don't care yeah. unless I was investing in a business, unless I was investing in a mom and pop shop, something. Well, yeah, then I want to see the numbers turn over. But even then, you don't know if something's going to be profitable or success, successful in business until about two or three years down the line. Then if it's shit at three years, as Kevin O'Leary would say, you take the dog outside the barn and you shoot it. But if it's successful, yeah. then you find out. But usually it's a 36, it's a 36 month mark. So, yeah. I mean, now, honestly, if you, I'm pretty sure this still exists. If you've ever bought Bitcoin and held it for three years or even 200 trading days, I'm pretty sure four and four years, even five years, six years, nobody's ever lost. Now I do think those numbers are a little bit, you know, that's a little bit uh, misleading because it literally was worth nothing. And now it's worth a lot. But I, but I do also believe in the rapid expansion, the S curve. I mean, do look at how it's getting adopted. Yes. The price will come up. But if you're investing in Bitcoin for the daily price and you plan on looking at it for a while, it's going to hurt. I mean, it's just going to hurt because I've invested yeah. in Bitcoin at 8,000, 10,000, 69,000, 45,000. When I was at 40,000, I'm going to tell you, I never, I don't put these things out on Twitter for this reason or price predictions. That's why Nick and I don't do that kind of stuff because at 40,000, I thought that was the bottom. Then 20, well, 20 seems like the bottom. But if it was at 10, I would still buy it. Like it doesn't matter yeah. to me personally. But yeah. I've tried to predict the price. Trust me, I've held some cash longer than I wanted to. And then it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, and, then I, and then I unloaded cash because I had a bunch of it left over. And then because you thought like, it was the bottom and it wasn't. And you're like, shit, it was that's where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> I'm just like, I, put, I put some extra dollars in and I thought it was going to bounce back up. And nope, sure didn't. Went down a little bit more. So now, so now I'm just sitting on it, waiting, waiting until it comes back up because that was like, supposed to be short-term savings you know for the house and Mm -hmm. uh now we're down a little bit on it but you know it's not it's not long-term savings anyways so or personal investing or personal finance dude my here's my goal and because the world's nuts eliminate all my bad debt any high interest debt any credit card debt bought a ring on a zero interest card make all my payments get no debt or maybe a little debt that's not really the problem like who really cares as long as you can service the debt and it doesn't really make a dent in your day who really cares I'm trying to accumulate yeah. one Bitcoin. Why am I going to try to accumulate one Bitcoin over starting my 401k now, over trying to buy the S&P now at a 30% dip or whatever? Why? Because what is the best 50 to 60 to 70 year play I can make for my retirement and my kids? I do believe it's owning one Bitcoin in a network that will never debase that one Bitcoin. And if I yeah. have one Bitcoin, trust me, when I get one Bitcoin, I will make those risky investments. I will invest in trying to invest in startups. I will do what I want with my money because you have... So, so much money saved in a network that will never debase. And that literal fact in 10 years is going to be enough for some of these big companies to be like, fuck this. I'm coming on over to the Bitcoin network because they would also like to have a treasury that they can trust. They're literally finding out in today's time that, well, 
we can, but then we have to continue to buy more just to keep that thing going. <laughs> like, oh, we have to print how much money? I mean, like you can, they can talk about quantitative tightening all they want, but what have they actually QT since, since they've announced it? They actually haven't shrunk their balance sheet at all because they can't. So that's why I buy Bitcoin. I mean, I think that's a good place to leave this, this day off. Sure. Nick and I are just regular nope. guys. We're, we're figuring it out. Maybe in like 10 years, because I do foresee us, whether the viewers and the fame comes or not, we just get on here to talk about this Bitcoin, to sharpen our knives, to talk to cool people that we probably shouldn't even be able to talk to. And honestly, just to stay in the news about what my personal biggest investment is, I am tracking this thing like a mofo for everybody that listens to this podcast. <laughs> Bitcoin. I'm watching the network. I see all of the news. I would yank all my funds out the moment I was like, yep, this, this is fake. Well, it's not, but I'm also not investing because I need it to go up to 100000 tomorrow so that I can feed my family. I'm investing yeah. money that I otherwise don't, not that I don't care about it, but where else are you going to put your money? You don't need it to live. You going to put it in a, am I going to put it in a savings account? For all those out there that are listening, Bitcoin is very liquid. If you have a problem, you can literally send it to Cash App, change it to cash within seconds. <laughs> or if you hold it on Stripe, you can move from Bitcoin to cash in seconds and it's not even taxable. So yep. if, if you have a if you do have a problem, Bitcoin actually is the most liquid form of money ever. The only reason why it's considered not liquid is because of capital gains. But they haven't actually figured out a way to tax your Bitcoin unless you tell them or buy it on an exchange. So so that's kind of like kind of here nor there as well. So I don't know. I get on yeah. this podcast, man, and every single time I'm like, find something that I'm going to be like, fuck this Bitcoin shit. Nope. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's unbreakable. It's unmovable. It's unfuckable money. And the only thing that you can really do is DCA into it. And if you want to build a trading stack, like if I had one Bitcoin right now, would I throw money into a crypto project? Yeah, because I have one Bitcoin. And if it blows up, sure, I put maybe I'll put like a little bit in it. But I'm literally putting that money into a crypto project. With the same money I'd put into my sports bets on Sundays during NFL season. <laughs> well, I don't believe in any of them. Like, I don't believe the people saying it. <laughs> marketing, I don't believe any of it. But maybe it'll go up because other people will buy it. That's cool. Like I, I don't really think that markets like that shouldn't exist. You want to lose your money? Lose your money. You want to win a shit ton of money and get lucky? Cool. There's a lottery. There's casinos all over the place. Shoot, they don't even tax uh, Indian casinos in America. Go do that. But for the money that I'm saving for my retirement, my current 401k is only Bitcoin. And until there's a spot ETF to where I can take 3% of my company's money, 3% of my own paycheck and get more Bitcoin with it currently, I'm not making any other investments. And I'm not going to be doing that for the foreseeable future. Because if you think, first of all, that we're already in a recession. I mean, every metric from quarter one and quarter two would show that. They're still waiting to tell you it's a recession. Like that's the most mind blowing part to me. We're in a recession. What are we waiting for? <laughs> it's a recession. The real thing they're not talking about, in my opinion, is we're headed for a depression. We're headed for a long period of time where markets don't go up. We're headed for a long period of time where things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. The only thing that I could see maybe making us money in during that time, maybe it is Bitcoin. But I guess that would only come from the fact that a, a bunch of other people's investments failed. And they're like, well, what can I actually buy that's like going to be worth it and honestly you're going to go to commodities bitcoin silver gold um you'd love to say treasuries but that's literally where the money is going to start coming from because they're not they're losing money i mean they're literally like i bonds you can have an i bond and keep it with inflation but they're saying it's on those i bonds they're saying it's like nine percent but what if inflation isn't actually nine percent well then you're losing money. And that's the best treasury. Well, you and you're get. also capped on how much you can put in those I bonds too. It's not like you can just dump all your wealth in it. I think it's and like dude, 9,000 bucks or something. You know, it's like, that's, well, that's not a lot. You, system, know? you boil that system down to it and <laughs> can't, even, can't even do anything about this. You can't change the system. You can't build anything on that system. You can't do anything on the system. Like the, we're there. This, we're this not allowed to. We're not allowed to. Money <laughs> that you can build. Oh, dude, shit. So. I don't know. I mean, like, I, it's so fun. I don't talk about Bitcoin off this podcast anymore until somebody's like, oh, how's your Bitcoin doing? I'm like, great, dude. How's your savings <laughs> account doing? I'm like, I, like I, that's my, it's my savings account. And yeah. if things go south, like I just told people, if you sniff it, like I told, uh, I'm a proud uh, Bitcoin maximalist when I told my, my boy Kev 
about Voyager. And I only knew about Voyager because of some Bitcoin maxis and the 3AC thing and how it was going to get deleveraged and so on and so forth. He pulled his money out. He has over half of Bitcoin. He had 25% of Bitcoin on Voyager. And I stopped him. I said, your money's going to get stolen from you. But he, he pulled it out in time. Like he got it out in time only because of the Bitcoin maximalist. Well, I see on Twitter, I was like, dude, this thing's going down. Just pull it out now. Don't even wait. Like, don't even wait a second. Like, get that shit off that exchange. Yeah, what, 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 I mean, what's the point of even having Bitcoin on an exchange? Is that like for the traders that like just that want to trade in and out of the market to make quick dollars? Or like, what are we people even feel, doing? Like, exchanges make people feel safe. I think that's really just, yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's silly. I mean, it's silly because then yeah. when you get down to it, Bitcoin, there's only 21 million. So if they're out here leveraging your Bitcoin to you as you buy it. Which that, is which is just too funny. You know, I read that I read that Bitcoin first article on um, on here on the podcast. I think it was uh, um, I think I just read half of it. But anyways, they had one deal in there where they had talked about. <laughs> They had talked about – no, it wasn't Bitcoin first. It was when they had announced that they were going to start um, allowing – Fidelity was going to start allowing people to own Bitcoin in a uh, digital asset account, which is a DAA, they called it. And they said that there was going to be institutional-grade security on their systems. And you're like – and you're, it's too funny because Fidelity has a whole digital assets team, and they're, they know Bitcoin. They know what Bitcoin is. I've read their stuff. They know what Bitcoin is. They're very, they've are very they got a very high understanding of it. And I think that it's hilarious. You're like, institutional, great security. Bitcoin, the network, the proof of work system that we talked about earlier is the largest. Guys, take a breath and sit down for a second because this is a real fact, a real fact. Bitcoin, the network with a capital B, is the largest computer network that has ever existed in mankind. It's got the most energy going into it than any other computer network in the entire history of the world ever, including governments, including Google and Facebook and Amazon, including all of those. Bitcoin is the largest network, computer network ever in the history of the world and you know what that means? The size of it now, and this is this is part of the the Bitcoin security deal. I don't know if you saw it on on the uh, the notes I'm taking, but I'm diving into currently what that process is. If somebody wants to hack the Bitcoin network, how do they do that? What is preventing them from doing that? So I'm diving into more of those details right now, which I'm excited to learn more about and kind of share on the podcast. But what I what what the headlines that I know are that. As the total hash rate of the network increases, which all that means for, for the people that don't know what that means, is that as the energy expenditure increases on the Bitcoin network, as more energy goes into the Bitcoin network, it becomes more difficult to hack and change the network and the protocol. And this is, this is pretty simple in that you have to have X amount of uh, computer power to validate uh, transactions and blocks on the blockchain. And then those all have to be also verified by the majority of the nodes, right? It's the 90% majority of the nodes. And now I, I may get some of those details mixed up there and I'm going to dive into it. I'll share it with you guys. But um, this is the largest computer network in the entire history of humanity. And we're going to talk about institutional grade security. It's like, no, dude, just put it in a freaking, just put it on a Bitcoin wallet and it'll never go anywhere. Nobody will ever touch it. It'll never be debased. And we're talking about institutional grade security. You're like, okay, all right. Yeah, that's a good way. That's a good way to close this one out. If everybody can't tell, it's been 90 minutes. Nick and I haven't had our own personal podcast in a while on top of the fact that, that weddings work, all kinds yeah. of shit. So we haven't really been able been to get busy. on our time and talk which is yeah. good nick and i'm gonna have to find new times to start talking bitcoin which is i don't really think it's gonna be a problem but as you can tell we could change this episode 32 nick and griff haven't talked for two weeks looks like everything with bitcoin still going well we're very happy <laughs> you know and it, it's so funny dude we're plebes we're not as nick carter put it founders <laughs> but uh we believe in what we're investing in 
and we're going to keep checking up week over week, every two weeks, every three, three weeks, we're going to get guests and looks like Bitcoin's doing well, Nick. It's just so funny, man. We have like, we haven't talked in a while and I'm so in it. Like I might not be able to talk about it, but I'm telling you, like all my Twitter feed is, is Bitcoin. All my uh, internet searches are Bitcoin. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know how else to put it other than you just put it, dude. It's the largest, most secure computer network ever all in a distributed ledger decentralized through the greatest innovation of the Bitcoin, which is proof of work. But um, pretty awesome episode, dude. Fucking 90 minutes nonstop. All Bitcoin stuff. You know, I, I, to your point, Griff, like we've had so many guests on in the in the past several weeks that you and I found ourselves is I, I was cracking up laughing about it, uh, telling telling some peeps about it the other day. But, you know, we literally started the podcast because we just talked on the phone all the time about Bitcoin and things that we were learning, and things we were excited about. And then we had we had this huge stint and I've been calling it like a podcast tour. Right. We've been on this podcast tour for several weeks now. where We've just had guest after guest after guest after guest, which has been a ton of fun. I've loved it. We've learned so much stuff. Um, literally, this episode uh, was kind of inspired by Charlie Spears episode. We, I, I went back and listened to it multiple times. I know Griff did as well. And we kind of brought our thoughts and then kind of tied it in with other things that are going on. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing is going back over those and bringing those thoughts back to the table to readdress them when it's just Griff and I. And it was funny. We found ourselves talking on the phone, not on the podcast in the middle of the week, just talking about Bitcoin because we had a guest on that week and we couldn't just hang out and talk about Bitcoin on the podcast. So Griff, uh, to your point, I'm excited to be back on just the two of us hanging out and get to chat a little bit. I think that this may reinvigorate my search for Bitcoin again. Because, you know, there for a while, it was more time spent on preparing for the episode, preparing for a guest. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it wasn't more so, it wasn't just Nick and Griff hopping on, hanging out, talking about the things that we had read and the things that we had seen and the, you know, things that we had listened to that week. It was more so like we got to prepare for a guest, right? Um, which, again, brought, brought forth a lot of fruit. And I'm excited to, to be back hanging out with my boy and just getting to chat, talk about Bitcoin. So. Man, it's been a super fun episode. I don't know if you noticed or not, but we didn't even get into the yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another episode of the Nick and Griff show. I'll probably record that and add that onto the front later on. <laughs> but we just do. We hopped right into it and it was a heater, dude, a heater. So, man, uh, uh, we did mention multiple links uh, to Connor. I mentioned to Connor Chepnick's podcast. Um, his episode, Bitcoin stuff that I was on was super fun. Uh, his podcast in general is a is a newer podcast i think he's got three episodes up now i've listened to them they're they're great it's great content great guy we've had him on the podcast and he'll come on again in the future um what was the other one that i'd mentioned um i mentioned he another posts, one he posted in the that joe that? episode or no i noticed you didn't that? post that on, i noticed you didn't post our joe episode on saturday no what no it's posted joe joe's up there you just didn't promote it like crazy yeah, I, I haven't made the clips yet, so we'll, we'll have to get those suckers up. But, hey, so go check out those links down below. There's one that I'm missing, but it'll be down there. And um, also hit us on Twitter, at Nick and Griff Show. Nick is spelled NYC, just like New York City, and spelled out A-N-D. Griff, G-R-I-F-F with two Fs, and show. At Nick and Griff Show on Twitter. Come hit us up, and we will see you next time. Peace. Peace.